Welcome, welcome to the Legacy Intention Series. I'm Dr. Stephen Hobbs from the Wealth Movement. So with that, um, let's jump on in. And uh, Patricia, your first and last name and a little bit about what you're up to. Patricia Morgan here. That's big M, little organ. And my business is called Solutions for Resilience. And that is a practice of therapeutic counseling, along with some professional speaking engagements. So that's kind of interesting. Can you just expand a little bit more on that? Because I think that might be wonderful to unpack, because I, th I think there's a lot more to that than just that one statement. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, the whole therapy piece, which is, you know, one side uh, sort of of the equation of where I turn up in the world as a seniorpreneur, I call myself a spunky seniorpreneur, uh, began when after, this is taking us years back, uh, over 45 years ago, we adopted a little girl at six years of age, and I was an early childhood educator. I thought it was God's gift to children, and she uh, woke me up that I wasn't because of a lot of turmoil in her behavior. I ended up in years of, after that, years of therapy, and by the time I was 40 years old, Previously believing I was stupid because of messages from my father, you stupid females, and a failing grade seven, dropping out of high school, but miraculously and with a lot of work at age 40, I graduated with a master's degree in clinical psychology. So for a number of years, I became a therapist. I became the kind of family therapist I wished we'd had when we were blamed a lot for um, our daughter's acting out behaviors, which years later, by the time she was 40, we got a diagnosis that she lives with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which affects her brain and her thinking. So you never know what's going to happen in the long run. Oftentimes, we don't really know what we're dealing with. And at the age of 53, I was doing workshops to empower women, to empower families. I'd been through a fair bit of questioning my own identity and was able to do that. And at 53, my wonderful job of empowering women was the funding was canceled by the federal government, found myself unemployed the same month that I ended up speaking to a room of people in the Alberta room of the Palliser Hotel with over 200 women. And they did a standing ovation. And I was asked if, the, if my name could be given out for events. And I said, oh, well, the $400 you paid me was very nice, but it must have taken me about 40 hours to get ready. And I was told, oh, you see the keynote over there? The keynote speaker, we paid her $5,000 and put her up in a nice room here at the Palliser. I said, you introduce me. And that woman, Linda Edgecombe from Kelowna, British Columbia, said, you go join the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. And I'd been a member for now over 20 years because I was 53, and here I am at 74. Wonderful. Yeah, and I always kept the therapy up. Yeah. So yeah, so when COVID broke out, a lot of professional speakers went in to almost collapse because, oh my gosh, what are we going to do, right? So gradually, we said, okay, we need to pivot. That word pivot was around a lot, right, in 2020, and purchasing proper lighting, proper sound. I bought myself a little podcast microphone, and I uh, offered in one of my presentations online to provide two free counseling sessions. I got overwhelmed on both ends. Resilience became a hot topic in 2020, as did people needing therapy. It's calmed down a little bit, but both ends are busier than they've ever been. And then I add to my plate, my caregiver role for a number of hours a week for my daughter and our grandson, who also has some disabilities. Very good. Okay. Well, th th I, I knew there was a little bit more in there is because 
I also understand from a legacy intention, intention for me is like the formless that you bring something into thingness, which is called legacy, right? And when you do that, there's usually threads, all right? <laughs> and those threads become, you know, cords and those cords become ropes and it, and it just weaves together. So thank you for sharing a little bit more um, about that. But I'd also be curious, what is your definition of legacy? The quick one would be living your why. Uh, uh, Senek, do you know that his first name gone out of my brain for a minute? Simon? Simon Senek, yes, who uh, has explored that whole idea of why. Also legacy for me also has to do with the question of, am I living on purpose? And I've taken those workshops and read those books. And about three years ago, I came up with my own definition of legacy, which are actually of purpose, which is very similar to legacy. And this is it. Ready? Okay. Your purpose is to know your gifts and give what you can. Trick is knowing your gifts and being able to articulate them. Well, and give I, what you can changes with with you know each year with each dynamic with each load of of what's on us and also health and time At each year i get older i find it takes more time to take care of this vintage body but it's looking pretty good eh i'll go with you i'll go with you <laughs> well i think it's it's useful um, my definition of legacy is about the useful what's and the what's are time, effort, and money that you gift others so that they can learn something from your lived experience. And that's why your lived experience, the thread that you gave in your story, and this notion of the gifts, right? And right. different than give, gift, you know, there, there's a different energy. I think give to head, gift from heart, you know, kind of idea. That's how I, I bring mm -hmm. them. So we share something that's really neat there. Okay, and so I'd like to go into a little bit more because this is the Legacy Intention series, mm -hmm. okay? And one of the words that you did mention was resilience. And I know that's in your background and you do um, a lot of work with resilience and you made reference to, you know, 2020, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, can you just share a little bit more about resilience? Because I think there's different threads there that even some of the people who are listening or watching now might go, that actually, that thread about resilience could be something I could pick up on. All right, great. So uh, <laughs> as a therapist, indeed, I wasn't aware of it at the time, was helping people bounce back, helping people get back on the road. And at some point along my journey, a business coach said to me, how is your audience any better? How have, have their lives been improved by listening to you speak? And I spontaneously said, well, they're more resilient. And she said, well, go with that because that makes a whole lot of sense. Though I started to specifically do research on resilience, I actually called the professor, Dr. L. Siebert in Seattle and asked him if he would ever consider doing a training in Calgary, Alberta. And I ended up sponsoring him coming to the University of Calgary and doing some training. He gave me uh, three questions to ask my women audience. And I ended up writing a book called From Woe to Wow, How Resilient Women Succeed at Work. And then he endorsed my book and uh, our relationship continued until he died a few years ago. He had a huge influence on me. I also took training from a resiliency trainer in California called Nan Henderson. Uh, also, we, in Calgary, we have um, Hampton, who, uh, Dr. Hampton, who does research. We also have uh, Unger, Michael Unger, uh, in the East Coast, that's a researcher in resilience. So my, my therapy came underneath it because really it's, resilience is a very broad term. It really means the capacity 
the capacity to deal with change, with stress, with adversity, with the poor behavior of other people, and sometimes, uh-oh, poor behavior of myself. You know, sometimes I slip up, I say the wrong thing, I write the wrong thing, I unintentionally may hurt somebody. And the capacity to come back includes stress management skills, emotional intelligence, self-awareness, some of the positive psychology research, actually resili resiliency research often comes under the umbrella of positive psychology. So how's it connected to legacy? Basically, are you living your, your best life with all the lumps, bumps, sags, roller coasters involved? Yeah. Well, the phrasing I'm using now is live the legacy you decide to leave. Mm -hmm. And it's a decision. Yeah. And therefore, the example that you've just unpackaged, unfolded for us is wonderful because in there, that's what I meant about there's different threads and they all come together is because you might go, well, maybe I could become an EQ coach or an EQ writer or whatever. And another time it might be, well, how might I use a nature-based approach to have conversations with people to get them to slow down and smell the trees, <laughs> smell the roses, right? I, and I, I think sometimes when people hear the word legacy, they get, it goes, gets so grandiose that they forget that there are threads of their, of their own history, as there are threads of things that are happening in their own lives at the moment that they could actually pull something together called legacy. Any thoughts about that? Well, as you were speaking, I was kind of thinking about my children, grandchildren. I actually have two great <laughs> grand boys, uh, friends, clients. And that is often when I hear that word legacy, it's what will they remember of what I said or did that impacted them, that supported them? At maybe some of my legacy has to do with some of the pain I created before I you know, got myself uh, improved, uh, <laughs> developed. Um, I am finding this aspect really interesting. I've never had older therapeutic clients ever. I've, people in their 60s and early 70s have contacted me talking about some of the dilemmas of uh, particularly of wanting to repair relationships. And I think that's really connected to legacy. Do I want to leave a legacy of pain in my family? Or do I want one that I matured into being able to say, I love you, I care. It's interesting. I have one, one woman who is struggling to say, I care let alone I love you. And my gener the generation of my parents, my mother and father, my mother was able to say it, but my father was never able to get those words out of his mouth. That's part of his legacy. Uh, the other part of his legacy is what a hard worker he was, how loyal he was to his, to his wife, contributions he made to his community. But there is also that legacy of he never told his children, all four of them, that he loved them. But if we're freeing, we can change that, right? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think um, this word like aging uh, that's being bantered around at this point in time, and I know you're involved in, in the world of, of aging and the conversation that's ensuing there. Yeah. Any thoughts that you would want to add that sort of connects that word to what we're talking about at the moment? Well, I get really frustrated with some of the cliches right? And the birthday cards, there's a lot. I did a workshop uh, during the Bell Hope uh, talk day. I did a little workshop. Uh, I made up these cards that were a takeoff of the cards that I could see at Walmart, the dollar store, wherever you buy, Hallmark, wherever you buy the cards, you know, uh, congratulations, you're a year older and you open it up and it says, at least you don't smell yet. So, there's a lot of fear mongering in our culture uh, about aging. Yeah. yeah, rather than the celebrating of the wisdom and lots of cliches. Oh, you're getting older, so you must be wise. I know a lot of silly older people that didn't wise up, they didn't mature, they didn't explore their legacy. Uh, there's lots of assumptions about 
different ages. And ageism, by the way, uh, can be any age. Like you can, you can be uh, ageism to your 10 year old by being really bossy or not really listening, right? Or saying you, you teenagers are brats. But this whole, the whole birthday card thing is really irritating. We'd never give a 17 year old a birthday card that says happy 17th birthday and you open up and it says, at least you don't have pimples. True. Right, but we think we think we got you know a free card for for doing the things with older people, so assumptions get in the way, and I know there's there are different groups that are trying to change the perceptions of ageism and the word senior. I use bunky senior because it's fun. I like the alliteration, but there's, there's a number of people don't even like that word senior because it has been stigmatized regrettably. Um, so the project I'm involved with is, has to do with nurses treat patients younger differently than older patients. The word senior, which I find bizarre, is about a 40 year span. Yet when I say baby, I mean up to about, I mean, about two years. If I say preschooler, I mean two or three years. If I say a uh, school ager, that's I don't know, seven years? Preteen, that's three years. Teenager is more years. But then, you know, I have the millennials and all these different descriptions. But we lump together vibrant 60 year olds, vibrant 70 year olds, vibrant 80 year olds, and probably typically there's 90 year olds that are starting to have some issues. Um, and there are realities of getting older, the metabolism slows down. My husband and I are going to more funerals. We got more people that are in hospitals that are our age. We've got cousins and friends that are not doing well. So there are some realities. Yes, yeah, and, 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 and that's great to, um, to frame up here, okay? Because you've got to pay attention to words because words matter. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm attempting to get this word legacy into mm -hmm. our storyline. And I will even talk about things like elder and the elder who becomes a mentor and the elder mentor who becomes a celebrant and the elder mentor celebrant who becomes a weaver and the four of those becoming an eco creator. And this is a language that I'm attempting through the writings that I'm doing. So I understand the importance importance of the words we're using and these jokes that sometimes you hear them nowadays you know and you sort of go mm, okay mm. Which, what do I do with that one right now all right and when you start okay. looking at myths and things that are that are being said and you know and there's sometimes you know this notion of mentor and we've talked about it already a mentor isn't that sort of that wise sage sitting on the top of a mountain all that it could be a 10 year old that you're interacting with because they have this really wonderful insight about what nature is about that you haven't explored as someone who's 60 or 70. Mm -hmm. right? right exactly and yeah and we we are part of the, being some many of us are a part of this fear of getting older and some of us uh, that know a lot, have had a lot of experience, question whether we could mentor somebody. The mm -hmm. other piece that I see uh, still going on a fair bit is the adoring of being younger by saying, oh, it's my 29th birthday. And I look at the person and I think, goodness sakes, you're looking pretty sick if you're 29. Why don't you say you're 99 and you don't you look great? Why I'm not? Gonna, why not? I'm gonna. I mean, if you're gonna lie, but why? Uh, the ideal position is: this is how old I am, and this is my years of experience on this planet. Here are my treasured memories. Here are my gifts to give. Here's what I love to do. So. And it, and it's that which is what makes up the live uh, the legacy, the lived experience, the gifts that you can give and, and, and that's so wonderful. But we're, we're actually getting to the time of closing up. And one of the things that I always do 
in mm -hmm. my interview series is always give the last word to the person that I'm, I'm interviewing. So what is it that you would like to share with the audience that could bring together resilience, aging, life purpose, why? <laughs> what, what would you like to share with us? I'll share th my three favorite quotations. Okay. All right. First one is by Maya Angelou. When I know better, I do better. Uh, that's been a big comfort to me because I made many mistakes and they had to do with I didn't know any better. I was doing my best I could. The second is the serenity prayer, which many people will know, but it still to this day sustains me in many ways. Grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And the last, the third, is from the ancient philosopher Hillel. It has also guided me. It was introduced to me when I was working on my master's degree when I was 40 years old. If I am not for me, who will be? If I am only for me, what is the point? Point meaning, what's your legacy? What's your purpose? Great. Well, thank you very much for that. And just in our final closing off, uh, Patricia will be giving us access to some videos and, and a handout. They'll be in the notes that she may have created in other places. And uh, I will provide that. But one of the other things that I'd like to do, Patricia, is maybe three months or so from now, do a follow-up, short follow-up about what's happening, where you're going, what's taking place, and uh, to be able to explore our legacy again, because I think it's important to hear the stories and here's what's going on. And, and mm -hmm. so it's not like, well, a, we, we met Patricia a couple of years ago. No, no, I'd like to sort of keep bringing you back and, and sharing some of the things you're doing. Is that okay for you? That's wonderful. And I wanna thank you for leading the way with honoring that we all have a legacy and that we can be in charge of it. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. So. With that, folks, uh, thanks very much. There will be more in the show more notes and wherever you find this video, if, there, if you want to comment, like, share, that's wonderful. If you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel and ring the bell. That'd be uh, wonderful. So with that, Patricia, thank you. Thank you.